politics or where shall we start? Yes, you know, Bonnie, like you said, you know, we have the elections coming up in Israel very soon. And, uh, and one of the things that was really interesting is that uh, we had a bunch of Jewish uh, friends as well as uh, uh, Christian leaders. They were uh, in the Netherlands this past week and including including Michelle Bachman and I've gotten a couple of emails from Michelle before uh, especially when she thought she was going to get involved with the president back back in 2016 she emailed me quite a few times and Michelle was there uh, right along being the cheerleader that we need to move the Hague the International Criminal Court to Jerusalem and uh, and I'm sure a lot of people would probably think, well, that's a great idea, you know, I mean, but we're missing the big picture here. There is definitely an Antichrist system on the rise. And most believers anyway already know that, uh, that when, um, you know, the third temple comes, it's not for Christ return. This is for an Antichrist return. And uh, you don't have to do a whole lot of biblical research to figure that one out. Uh, but then again, there's also two other things that are coming out. It seems like there, there, there's some really good Jewish people in Israel that are trying to turn the tide in their government, but I'm afraid it's not going to happen. Uh, so they've, they've leaked out more information on Netanyahu uh, in his case number 4000. But it's really not going to go anywhere. I mean, let's face the facts. I've watched Netanyahu upset a lot of things in the government. Uh, there were some very prominent um, politicians there uh, that were moved out of office uh, right during these last elections and stuff. And, uh, you know, one of them was, uh, uh, oh gosh, I'm blank on his name and I should know it because I've, I've corresponded with him before too. But, uh, but there were a couple of women that, were, that ended up losing their seats in the Knesset. Uh, that were very prominent, but they're, when I say prominent, it doesn't mean that they had good policies, but I bring this up, uh, Shake this one of them, uh, she, she, was taken, she was taken out, and yet she was very pro-Israel, um, uh, no two-state solution, she very much hated Palestinians, but that didn't help keep her in office, but a lot of people don't realize why. It is the Orthodox community that Netanyahu is really forming a very strong alliance with. It's the only thing that's going to keep him in power. And he did make the promise that he would allow the Talmud to become the law of the land. And so therefore, a woman can't be in power according to Talmudic beliefs. And so, uh, although there is a lot that of... That is disgusting. Yes, I agree. They totally forget all the biblical women that were heroes in our country uh, over the many, many thousands of years uh, in the past. That's man's rules. Well, it's exactly right. It's not biblical. But yet they call it, though, here's the sad thing, Bonnie, that's what they call, they say that's the, they, they, they call it the Torah. They don't, they don't tell you the truth that it's Talmud, you know. It's the Torah. It's the oral law, by the way. They say they don't want nobody to know the truth about these things. That's and, right. People don't go back and read the Torah. They think that, you know, everything that uh, Yeshua uh, mm, Gain said about their customs and the and the laws of man in the New Testament, it, it's not Torah. They think it was Torah, like the hand washing and the and the the yes. the, the pitchers that held sacred water, not sacred, but you know, pretty much sacred water. Uh, they didn't realize, uh, they don't realize that this is not Torah. <laughs> this that, is man's law. That's exactly right. They teach, uh, as, as Yeshua said, you teach uh, for the commandments of God, the traditions yes. of man. Yes. And, uh, and, and when he's de denouncing the, the, you know, oh, what, let's not go down that, but law in, in the New Testament is so obliterated, people cannot tell what is being talked about, God's law versus man's law. It is totally confused. Well, you know, speaking of, of between the difference in those, you know, there's one thing that I found very interesting. I think this is in the book of Ephesians. 
Uh, when we read in Genesis 3 about the enmity that God would put between the, the serpent and the woman and between her seed and his seed, uh, I, one day, just not too long ago, and I did a teaching on this because I got curious. So I said, okay, we already know enmity means hatred, but if he's going to put that hatred there, where do we find a fulfillment of this? And, uh, and if you read, whether it be Romans or Ephesians, uh, second chapter, 15th verse, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for uh, uh, to make himself of twain one new man making peace. Okay, now when we see this, we have to understand that uh, does that mean thou shalt not kill no longer means thou shalt not kill? No, because we already know the scripture talked about that it should be within your heart. You know, the law should be within your heart. So there was, uh, you know, and even when you're dealing with a Melchizedek priesthood, what do we deal with with Melchizedek? Melchizedek represented a, 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 a different priesthood that was not descendant of Aaron. And yet, in the book of Psalms, I believe it's in chapter 110, uh, you know, it speaks about that Melchizedek priesthood that would come into power one day. And, uh, but that enmity, which you have to understand, when you read there in Ephesians, when you look at the word commandment and ordinances, that can be oral Talmudic law as well. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was the, the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, that is... Again, that is a law that is with it, that should be written on the tables of your heart, which is interesting that the, the scripture likens it to the tables of your heart because your your heart is made of two uh, two sides anyway, just like the two stones that Moses brought down. So we have, uh, if it's written on your heart, it's just like the two tables of stone. Makes you wonder if the stones weren't like the shape of a heart. Not like the heart we draw in a picture, but similar to the heart that's in the human heart. Maybe so, who knows? Just a conjecture. So, but at any rate there, uh, you know, it's, it's really weird. Yes, and bringing, you know, I don't, bringing the Hague to Jerusalem will set up Jerusalem as the center, the, the capital of the, the world, the final beast empire. Satan desires the very spot where ancient Jewish history says God started creation, and I wonder if this isn't the same place where he says in Pro, uh, Job, uh, you know, to Job when he's rebuking him, where were you when the sons of God sang at the dedication of the world? And I think that that ceremony dedicating uh, it took place in Jerusalem. This really is the capital of the earth and uh, if you want to do business with the earth, you have to go to the capital, and that's Jerusalem. Satan understands that. He's got to get Jerusalem. I think that's what we're seeing. What do you think, Stephen? Well, just like you said, Bonnie, this is the place that he wants, and it's always been the center of contention is Jerusalem. Uh, and it's where Jacob saw the ladder. He saw the angels ascending and descending. Uh, it's where Christ came. It's where he brought redemption. Uh, he had to pay the price right there. Uh, I know that there are some that believe that Adam died on the same place where Christ died at. I've heard that uh, story told before as well. Wow. And, same uh, place where Isaac was uh, sacrificed? Exactly. Oh, well, almost sacrificed. Exactly. So, and, you know, when I was mentioned to you about uh, just a moment ago about how the religious, uh, the, the, when I say the religious, we have to understand. You can't, Jews are just like uh, Christians. You can't lump everybody in the same boat. Uh, we have uh, Orthodox Jews, and we have Hasidic Jews, and we have, uh, you know, Reformed Jews, etc., all different types of Jews. But even in the different branches that you have in Judaism, let's say the Hasidic Jews, which are your more, uh, your Jews that wear a certain particular traditional garb, whether it be the black coat, black hat, and then there's different types of hats that are worn by different types of groups, uh, groups etc., but nonetheless, in the Hasidic groups, these are the ones that are mainly uh, the Chabad organization specifically, because this is where Menachem Schneerson come from, the, uh, the, the Rebbe, they call him the Rebbe 
uh, who is the one that really pushed the Noahide law system, things like that. And uh, they're the ones that are in very much control with governments around the world. They're the ones that are working with Netanyahu to get in power there uh, and to really to bring about a religious state, which would totally, Bonnie, transform anything that people have ever known. As a tourist, you're going to find things are going to change drastically. But there's this article here that I have up on the uh, screen, Middle East Eye. It says how Netanyahu is using religion to shape Israel's elections. And, uh, and of course, that's exactly who we have on the screen there. It is the Haredi community uh, that is behind uh, the, the, the prime minister to get him in office. And it's the same group that is behind Trump saying that they will make sure that he is reelected because they need the two to work together to bring about this Antichrist system and to bring in, to usher in their own Messiah. And but what's sad though, Bonnie, this is where we are seeing there are not all, and when I say messianic leaders, this is not all messianic leaders by no means. So please don't, let's don't put everybody in one boat. But there are a select group of messianic leaders, specifically some of those coming directly out of Israel, that are working uh, to put the believers of Yeshua, the believers in Jesus Christ, underneath Talmudic rabbis in Israel. Which, by the way, they're already talking about the, uh, the separation of uh, the sexes in Israel. Now, that's something that's been going on for years before in Israel anyway, but this would become mandatory uh, if this next election goes the way it looks like it might go. It'll be that when you ride on a bus, you won't be right. If you're married, you won't be riding with your husband. Uh, well, you might get to ride on the same bus, but you'll be sitting in the back. Uh, we had a, in fact, there was a Jewish woman that came from America. She was a university professor, had come to Israel, and she got into a bus, and when she did, she sat down in the front seat of the bus. Well, it was a bus that had a lot of Orthodox men on there, and as soon as she sat down, one of the guys said, you have to get up, you're to go to the back of the bus, you're a woman. Well, she said, no, I'm not doing it. And he looked at her and he said, look, this bus driver will not leave until you go to the back of the bus, so do what you're supposed to do. And she refused to do it. Well, they beat her, is what they did. Uh, and, you know, the, the rest of the, the story is history. But uh, this is what's coming in Israel. And if it's coming there, and they're talking about moving the Hague, the international court system, to Israel. And, 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 and here Michelle Bachman, and, and here's the sad thing, Bonnie. Michelle Bachman doesn't realize what she's getting herself into either. Uh, Michelle Bachman used to be a, a, an evangelical believer, a Pentecostal woman that knew a lot of the things uh, that, sh that, that should be more correct, but she's turned that tide. She went a totally different direction. That's one reason why she contacted me. She knew there were videos I'd done about her, and she asked me if I would take those videos down because it hindered her political future. And only when, after I took, I did take down all but one. Now, Michelle didn't know that there was still one up there, but she didn't know about it, so she didn't ask, so I didn't remove it. Good for that. But anyway, once I took it down, then the Vatican released a document saying that uh, she has now separated her ties from all the fanatics in the world. Well, they missed one, Michelle. Sorry about that. But you didn't know, so hey, I left it up there. Um, but you know, Bonnie, this is where it's headed. And I think that's the problem, that Trump, with his vast uh, cheering section in this country of Christians... I mean, his rallies are off the charts. He's filling stadiums. He's yeah. going to do it again. That the people don't know where he's leading them. Exactly. And, exactly. And the messianics aren't going to know. No, they're not. Because, you know, Bonnie, they, like I said, when I, and I went off course a little bit there, the messianic, uh, the, the teachers that are out there are telling the believers, especially if they are of a Jewish descent, that they have to go up underneath Talmudic rabbis. Now, and I'm not going to quote a name here, but I will say it like this here, quote unquote, it does not matter if they're in the wrong. The Messiah will correct that when he comes. Now that's someone that says they believe that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. And he's telling them, and he even goes so far as to say, uh, I know that many things that they teach is not right. But he said it doesn't matter. Because why, Bonnie? Here's what's happening. They're, 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 they're teaching that, um, 
is like like even when Michelle Bachman when she's talking about the Hague needs to be moved to Jerusalem. You know, the scripture says the law will go out of Jerusalem. All right, uh, just like they'll say uh, one of the big ones they love to quote, and I used to quote the same thing. So I have to say, forgive me if you've heard me teach this before. Uh, I had to be corrected myself, but it was by the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit through actually a sister, a friend of ours, Sister Jennifer, uh, contacted my wife, was talking about the, uh, the ten men, the, take, the ten men of the nations, take the hold of the skirt of a Jew, and we will say that we hear that God is with you, uh, we will go with you. And I had not even really studying it in the Hebrew language on that particular uh, uh, verse there. I looked at it from the English side, and so I was thinking, okay, well, maybe it's the two witnesses. That was my thought. But I know in a lot of the, the messianic circles that are, and I say circles, but it's the ones that are specifically pushing the ideology that we have to go underneath the Jews, and, uh, and I will speak of one, and I can call him by name because I consider him a friend as well, Tovia Singer. Tovia, and he's really, he's having a, an, an incredible uh, amount of success in converting believers of Yeshua into Judaism, uh, which is totally rejecting Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and uh, which is really sad, it's sad. But, but at least with Tovia, the reason, uh, the only reason I, I, I can have a little more respect for Tovia, because Tovia is not a professing believer in Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hamashiach, uh, he is a Jew that believes that Christians are wrong, and so he's, he doesn't come across as a hypocrite. He just speaks from his heart of what he believes is right. And he believes that the New Testament is wrong. He believes that uh, this whole thing about Yeshua being the Messiah is wrong. Okay, but at least he's honest about what he believes. But he also uh, says that we will say that we have inherited lies. He quotes the scripture. We will say that our fathers have inherited lies. And again... And I've done the teachings on this. I won't go into that one. I'm going to just use the, uh, the, the one with the, uh, they take a hold of the skirt of, uh, the ten of the nations to take a hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, we hear that God is with you. Uh, you know, and, and that's found, let me just pull, I'll pull it up because we're going to share this on Yana's channel. So for the sake of our friends that, that might want to see where this is actually at, if you go, that's in Zechariah's prophecy. Uh, so for friends that are listening on Hebrew Nation Radio, and by the way, while I'm looking this up, let me just, remind our friends that listen to this broadcast. Uh, the, the, the folks there at the Hebrew Nation Radio, they are so kind to allow us to, to air these insights. And I can't say enough from my heart. And I really say this from my heart, my feelings for these people there. Uh, and, you know, just pray about it and see how God leads you. Leads you. But remember them as well when God lays on your heart how to give and stuff, because if it wasn't for their generosity, uh, we couldn't bring these messages with, with myself and Bonnie each week and everything, so I just wanted to say that. Um, but if we go to Zechariah chapter 8, you get down to verse 23, and I think it's the same in the, in the, in the English Bible, but I got, I'm using a Hebrew Bible here. We read this, you know, and I'll start at verse 22. Yea, many peoples and mighty nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Okay? Thus saith the Lord, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nation shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, and again, I have to confess, I was guilty the same. I was thinking that, in my own thought, it was they're going to take the hold of the skirt of Moses and Elijah, or Moses, or excuse me, Elijah and Enoch, whichever way you might believe that particular uh, thought on the two witnesses that are coming. I thought it was that. But it's being taught really passionately today and uh, by the messianic leaders, specifically those that are Jewish messianic leaders, that the Gentiles are going to take hold of the skirt of the Jews, that we should be taking hold of the tzitzit of the Jews right now because we don't have all the truth. And it's really coming down to this, Bonnie. It's coming down to Kabbalah. They don't want to really say that, but it's really Talmudic and Kabbalistic beliefs. In fact, Tovia Singer, who's more honest about it, unlike some others that say, oh, Steve said that I, I believe in Talmud or Kabbalah. No, I don't. And then the next thing you know, they're teaching from it right there, plain as day, right? 
But with Tovia, it's different. Tovia is just straight up, he's straightforward. He'll tell you, he says, without Talmud, you don't have a New Testament. Well, that's total false fallacy. But he does make one point correct when he says this, though. He says, because of the vowels. He said the vowel points that were put in the, in the, in the, uh, the Masoretic text were done by, that is a Talmudic, uh, that was done by the rabbis. It's a Talmudic thing. And he said, therefore, we depend upon our translation of our Bible based on Talmudic tradition. All right? Now, my problem is, is I know that most of those uh, vowels that were put in have totally uh, misconstrued prophecy and biblical text completely. And, and one clear example is uh, from the book of Numbers, uh, where they put the vowel points in there when Moses is talking about the Nephilim. Uh, we translate that giants, I think, in the King James Version or NIV or one of those. But... Uh, it's actually the word Nephilim, and Moses clearly spelled it differently when he talks about the sons of Enoch. He calls them Nephilim, but when he talks about Enoch himself, he spelled it Nephilim. But of course, what did the rabbis do? They put their vowels in to make it look like he was just a Nephilim. His father was a Nephilim, but that's not what Moses wrote. So we know that the, the, that the rabbis were doing wrong in what they were doing. All right, so, and I have many, many, many more cases. That's just one of many. So I want to get... Yes, when, when it suited them, they changed the vowels, they changed the word, they changed... Yes. The, 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 the tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav the Yehovah, Yehuva, Yehud, Yehua, whatever people say. It changed that name to just Adonai. Well, and not only that, Bonnie, I mean, you know, they put vowel points in there. And even though they say, okay, you're supposed to say Hashem, uh, you know, which in Hebrew means the name. But in, 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 in another language, uh, it's in the, uh, the, the language that you see on, on some of these rocks that they have out there. I forget the name of that, that language there. It means the rockets. So, you know, what, what do you want to say there? You want to say the rockets or you want to say the name? I, I, I don't know. But, but the thing is, we were given the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and that, that's a good name to me. Okay, yeah. until we can figure out the rest. But when you start putting vowel points in there, uh, you might, and, and this is what happens, Bonnie, I mean, it almost makes me wonder, and I only say this as a conjecture, so let me really clarify this when I say this. When I think about a Revelation, when it talks about the blasphemous names, I can't help but wonder if it's not because they're giving so many different names to, uh, you know, our Heavenly Father. You know, one pronounces this way, one pronounces it that way, one pronounces it this way here. Is that the blasphemous names? Which we know that's on that beast. It's not the people themselves. But then again, who's the one that created all these different types of ideas? I, I don't know. I don't know. Just a conjecture. That's right. And who hid the true name, the true, in the beginning? I mean, that was done by the rabbis. It was too... Uh, to it, it, ineffable to speak, so the common man couldn't speak it, despite the fact that, you know, uh, once his name was introduced to Moses, I mean, it was used all throughout by everybody. Well, you know, Bonnie, even even the even the very usage when Moses first asked God, and let me just take this. I think it's really important the way I just share this with everybody while we're here right now. But if you were to go, and we'll come back to Zechariah here in just a second here. But if you go there to Genesis, uh, or no, I'm sorry, in the book of Exodus, and I believe it's the third chapter here. Uh, and let me get here to where he says it here. Um, yeah, here we go, right here. All right. And, uh, okay. Ve'yomer Moshe el, el, el uh, Elohim. All right. And, and Moses speaks to God. And he says, Hine anochi bo el bane Yisrael. All right. And uh, I said to God, Behold, when I come to Israel, ve'amati lehem, and I will say to them, Elohai avatechem shelachani elayachem, you know, the God of my fathers has sent me unto you, ve'amruli, okay, mashemo. Okay, and they will say to me, what is his name? Maomer, what do I say, Elohim? What do I say to them? And then God says, Ve'yomer Elohim el Moshe, and God says to Moses, Ihaye asha Ihaye, 
ויאמר כל טעמה לבני ישראל יהיה של אחני עליכם. All right, which means, and God said to him, Moses, I am that I am, and he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent uh, me unto you. Now the interesting thing is, though, Bonnie, in the Syriac writing of the Bible, do you know this is what Abraham called him as well? I am that I am. I am that I am. Wow. And, uh, and yet, you know, but there again, that's, uh, you know, I don't want to get into to mess people's minds up on what they what they understand right now. But the point is, is there's so many different ideas at this point, especially if you take Yod Hey Vav Hey, all kinds of different ideas out there. Uh, but now let me run back to Zachariah before I you lose know, this we thought. We have to cut for the second half, Steve. Okay. So I'm right. just going to jump right in here. Stay with us, everyone, and we'll see you in a minute. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're going to go back to Zechariah, where uh, uh, ten uh, men will take a hold of the wings of one Jew. Absolutely. All right, now, so we're looking at this, Bonnie, and, and as I said, a uh, good friend of ours had called my wife. She was talking to her, and she said, you know, you ought to have Stephen. She said, I know he speaks Hebrew, and, and he reads this. So she said, look at him. It says, Ish. Just a man, a single man. It's not like they're taking a hold of the Timmy people of the nations are taking a hold of a, a whole group of Jews and taking a hold of their skirt and say, we hear that God is with you. And uh, and there was uh, this this one rabbi, he was actually with Mark Viltz and they were down in uh, South, um, South America. And one of the big issues, they, they, in fact, they were out, they did a video about me and he was making that issue. He was bringing up that scripture and he says, you know, Benun, you need to pay attention to this. He said, because it says plainly here, okay, we have heard that God is with you. And he goes, what is that in Hebrew? Imchem, imchem, he makes the big issue. Imchem, it's plural, it's with you. You know, Nelecha Imchem. Kishamanu Elohim Imchem. All right, we heard that God says that we are with you. Now that's all true. And, but I said, here's though where the, the issue is that even I had overlooked myself because I wasn't paying attention to it in Hebrew. When he says they're going to take a hold of the wing, all right, he says, Vichachazeku Bikanaf, which is the wing. Which, by the, by the way, Bonnie, that word, the wing, and taking hold of a tzitzit, is believed by many that it means a tzitzit when it says the bikanaf, the wing. All right? And that's because when Moses gave the commandment to put the tzitzit, he said to put it on the wing of your garment, the, the, the kanaf of your garment. All right? But if you look at the Hebrew Matthew, the woman that takes a hold of Yeshua's hem of his garment, as we see, it actually says she took a hold of his tzitzit. But when it came to when Yeshua was up in Galilee, and it says in our own Bible that they, you know, they took a hold of the hem of his garment there, it actually says they took a hold of Bikanaf. They took a hold of the wing of his garment. They were grabbing him by his sleeves just to touch him, just, you know, reaching out like anybody would do, right? So there is a difference there, but that does, that's not the important issue. The important issue is, is when, they, when it says there, they will take a hold of the wing, it says, Ish Yehudi, singular, of a Jewish man. One Jewish man, they take a hold of his wing. Then they say, we hear that God is with you. All right? We will go with you because we hear God is with you. All right? Now the question is, because even myself included, I used to put this prophecy in the future. But Bonnie, it's been fulfilled and I never realized it until that sister asked me to go back. She said, Steve, you got to go back and look at that. Tells that to my wife, right? Well, where was it fulfilled at? Of all places, all right? This is where it's at. If you go to the book of Acts, and, we, and, and, and this is really going to make a lot of sense to a lot of people when I tell you how this plays out, because I'm like, I could not believe this myself. Acts chapter 2, right? This is the day of Pentecost, all right, 
Now they had already taken a hold. They'd already taken a hold of his wing, but then you have to wonder, why is it plural then? Why do they say, we hear that God is with you? Well, they took a hold of his wing when he was up in Galilee. And these were people that were coming, including the Syrians, as we find out. The Syrians and the Jews, they were both Jew and Gentile, were taking a hold of his wing. But the true fulfillment of this is when we get down and they came out of the upper room, the 120, they were stammering in their, 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 their whatever they were doing, and the people all heard in their own language. And then we read in here, uh, let's see exactly where that's at there. Um, mm. Okay, here we go. Yeah, here we go. I got it right here. And it says, uh, this is, uh, the noise was, uh, it was noised abroad, the multitude came together, were confounded because it, the, the, uh, uh, oh, no, back up to verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now the word Jews is actually the word Judeans. In other words, they were they weren't, they weren't living in Israel. They were there dwelling there, part of the holiday system. And they were Judeans is what they were. In other words, they are, their forefathers were from this land. I believe, this is a conjecture on this one part. Why does it say devout men? All right, now we know that that means like a righteous man's things like that. But they were from every nation under heaven. In other words, they had sent representatives there. Could it be... Where we get today, and this is something that has been in Israel and has been believed by the Jewish people for centuries on end, even millennia, ever since God said to, Mo, uh, to, to Abraham, if there be ten righteous, I will spare the city for the sake of ten. Talking about Sodom and Gomorrah when Lot was down there, if the angels could find ten righteous there. So when you have devout men and they're coming from the nations, perhaps they were traveling by groups of ten. Conjecture, I have to admit that part on my side there, but then we get all the names of where they're from, and we find out it's not just Judeans that come, but it says even the proselytes that were with them. And they were from all over the world, including all the way down to Saudi Arabia and all the way out to China, Asia, etc. All these nations, and I forget now, I think it's like 37 different nations were represented there. And they were what? Because remember, Yeshua had already said, because some people say, no, this is actually a prophecy of the house of Israel. What did Yeshua say to his apostles when he sent them abroad and also the 70? He said, I'm sent only into the lost sheep of the house of what? Israel. And so what did they do? When they went out abroad and he told them, don't take anything with you, only, you know, your staff and go. They went to what? The lost sheep of the house of Israel into those foreign lands. And then what did they do when they came back? They were there at Pentecost when the fulfillment came. You had both the house of Judah and you had what? A remnant. Remember how the scripture says, Bonnie, when it talks in there about uh, uh, the Lord was saying, I forget where this is actually written at, but he says, though Israel be as the sand of the sea, your descendants, Abraham's descendants, he said, though they be as the sand of the sea, yet only a remnant will return. All right, that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Even though the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah had even, you know, well, the house of Israel mainly still living there, but the house of Israel was dispersed in all the land and they were like the sand of the sea everywhere else, but only a remnant, only a small number of them returned that day. And when they heard what happened there, they weren't like that group there. That's the other where it says in verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Well, that was your Pharisees saying that. But they said, men and brethren, what must we do to receive this Holy Spirit? They embraced it. Why? Because that was the fulfillment. They had, because the, the 120 had already taken a hold of the wing of he that was a Jew. And now they are saying, we hear that God is with you. What must we do now? That's when the scripture was actually fulfilled. It's not a future issue anymore. So, yes, I have I have read the uh, Jewish um, you know writings where they say you know uh, this is this and will make slaves of the world. Those seem you know, they'll take hold of us, they'll follow us, and we'll make them slaves. I think that's in Isaiah or Jeremiah. Um, uh, 
and we will rule the world. Uh, th those are two of their favorites, it seems. Yes, and you know, Bonnie, the thing is, is that that is really taught amongst the Orthodox of Israel today. And, and granted, I used to be among these people. I happen to love my brothers and sisters that are Jewish, even in the Orthodox communities very much. And it doesn't mean that even in the Orthodox community, not everybody thinks the same way that, but they're under that teaching. And this is why, like for example, when, when you read in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew 23, Yeshua goes through there and he's calling the, the Pharisees. He says, you're a bunch of vipers, you're uh, your serpents and, and generation of vipers, in fact, uh, he goes so far as to say. And then if you get down to verse 34 in chapter 23, we have an entire sentence that we don't have in, in the Greek version that's in the Hebrew Matthew. And it's really in a critical sentence because the Hebrew Matthew says, Then Yeshua turned to the crowds and said to them. And then he goes, that's when he goes into, how often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. He said, so now your house will be left desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Now what's interesting about that, Bonnie, why, why did that happen? We didn't see that in the Greek. So it makes it look like, well, the Pharisees weren't really that bad. No, the point was when he turned to the crowds, they were spellbound by their leaders. And because they were so spellbound by the leaders there, they could not break free from it. So Yeshua tells them, your house now is going to be left desolate. You're not going to be filled with the Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh. You're not going to receive this because you are spellbound. Like today, people are so spellbound by these pastors that are leading the people right back to Israel. And it's even in the Messianic realms. It's in, the, in no doubt, maybe even in Hebrew roots, some of the movement there. It's the people are so caught up with what's going on in Israel, thinking this is a godly thing, forgetting that we know this is an Antichrist system coming, that they're going to miss the important thing and to realize this is not of God. And I have up right now, Bonnie, in front of me, this is just part of a little tiny piece of the PowerPoint that I'll be doing in Pennsylvania uh, this coming Saturday, which, by the way, if you want to come, I think there's still a few seats left. So if you happen to catch this on the broadcast, you live in the area or something like that, just go to IsraeliNewsLive.org, look up Pennsylvania Conference 14th, which is this coming Shabbat. Uh, love to see you there, but you have to just put a comment. That's all you have to do. There's no charge. Just leave us a comment. You're coming, and then that way there we can approve it for you. But I, I was, as I've been doing all this in-depth study, one of the things that I've dealt with was from the book of Ezra. Uh, because one thing that a lot of times we, we don't pay attention to is that the Pharisees had corrupted the priesthood. And it was actually before they were even Pharisees. It was the priesthood when they were in Babylon. The priests themselves had corrupted the true priestly line. And it's important. There's one scripture we need to know. And I want to read this one here, Bonnie, from Leviticus chapter 21. So people really understand this. In chapter 21, verse 12, God says here, He's given the command of a priest. He says, Neither shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a one divorced or profaned woman, or a, now they write in the English, harlot. Zana is not a harlot. Zana is a whore. See, a harlot could be a woman that's not married, and that's different. A whore is a woman that's married and then commits adultery. There's a difference. So he's not to take a whore. These shall he not take, but a virgin of his own people shall he take to wife. And he shall not profane his, watch this, his seed among his people. For I am the Lord who sanctify him. Now that was a commandment of God. He goes on, the Lord Spoken to Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed throughout their generations that hath, that, uh, that, that hath a blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. Now, when Yeshua came, Bonnie, Yeshua, he is not a Levite. He is not 
the Kohanim. He's not from the, the line of Aaron, but from the line of Judah. Which, as the scripture says, there was no mention of the priest coming from the line of Judah. So, this is why the apostles of Yeshua recognized that he was from another priestly order, and that was from the order of Melchizedek. The very fact that he offered the communion service itself showed that he was replacing the priest of the Levitical priesthood that was no longer allowed to be priest because they had violated the commandment of Leviticus chapter 21. They had mingled their seed and violated God's law. All right, now I'm going to prove to you they violated it. When did they violate it? If you go to Ezra, uh, and we'll go real quick to Ezra 9. I know we probably don't have a whole long time left, so I'll try to go quickly with this. In the book of Ezra, in the ninth chapter, they're building the second temple. Everything's ready to go. Remember how they say Trump is Cyrus today? Well, everything is about ready to go. History is repeating itself right now. And they're getting all the priestly order is set in line over there in Israel. And everybody's all excited. They already got a high priest and everything. And we got the Sanhedrin and we got all the priestly order in place. And then we find out, Ezra finds out one major problem happens. Now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel, verse 1, and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perzites, the Jebusites, Ammonites, the Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been first in this faithlessness. They broke Bonnie, and it's mainly the leaders of the priest. Not to say that maybe when they came back from Babylon, there might not have been some good priest. There, there were. But who was? it was the Maccabees that put the Hasmonean dynasty in, and what few priests that were still good, they drove them out, and some believe that that's the ones that ended up in Qumran. But... When they did that, I believe, now this is a conjecture, but I believe the, the, the Maccabees were probably, because they do believe that they were Levitical bloodline, but they said they didn't have a right to be in the priesthood. That's according to Jewish people. Why didn't they have a right to be in the priesthood? I think it's because they were children of those sins that happened in Babylon. You know, so when you look at Revelation 17, and we read there, that uh, we get this famous scripture in verse uh, 5, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What's that mystery? Well, the mystery, which is actually written in the word of God, but nobody sees it anymore. They've forgotten about it. And that's how, the, that's how Satan, uh, Satan got his head wounded. The serpent's head was wounded by Christ because the scripture says the woman's seed was going, to, was going to wound the serpent's head. And he told you the Pharisees were a generation of vipers. They mixed in those very nations they mixed in with Bonnie before Israel came into the land, when God commanded Israel to drive out the Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, and Amorites, why did he want them drove out? Why did he want them all killed? Because they had mixed their own seed themselves in with the Nephilim, the fallen angels, and they had brought back the giants in the land. But instead, we find out they made a covenant. That's why all of them weren't killed. And that's why when, when Israel got sent into Babylon, the captivity, so went the Jebusite, Ammonite, Amorite, and all the rest of them. And then who? It wasn't all the other tribes. It wasn't Benjamites, and it wasn't uh, uh, the, 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 the tribe of Judah that got mixed up over there. It was only the Levites that mixed the seed. And they broke the covenant of God. Christ had to return. He had to return for one reason, because the priest line had been corrupted and the new priest line of Melchizedek had to replace it so the bread could be broken once again.
And you have gone over before uh, the when they stood before Ezra that uh, that there were certain Levites then who were priests that refused to put away their Canaanite, Jebusite, all that of yes. their wives. So. Uh, do you think, Stephen, that the priesthood today that's being set up in Israel as we speak is specifically chosen to only include, to ex exclusively include some of that Canaanite, Jebusite, etc. Well, DNA? according to Nehemi Gordon, and, uh, and I know also, not only Nehemi Gordon has said this, but also Tovia Singer has made this statement before as well. Nehemi has said that no Orthodox rabbi today can be an Orthodox rabbi unless their lineage traces back to the Pharisees. Uh, and this is one reason, and you can find this in much of our literature. I mean, I've got, I've got the Sensino Talmud, which is like the Encyclopedia Britannica. I have uh, the, the Aruch Shulchan, another Encyclopedia Britannica of Israeli rabbi, rabbinical writings. Uh, uh, many, many other. I have the Mishnah. I have all these things here. You, we can read it ourselves. The Sensino Talmud is more important because that's the Talmud where you don't get to hide everything from the people because we know what it is. And that's right. I mean, these are whitewashed. This is yes. like Qurans that, or you'd have whitewashed all the violence. Yes, yes. So the thing is, is uh, Nehemiah made that clear that the Pharisee, the the the, the, the Orthodox rabbis have to be descendant of the Pharisees. And that was what uh, even in historically set the Pharisees apart from all the others. They believed in Talmudic law, oral law, whereas the Sadducees did not. Sadducees were more like Karaites. Believe it or not, even though Yeshua condemned them, the Sadducees were more of the Karite believers than that of the Pharisees. They believed only in what was written by the prophets, although they well, didn't see the word of no God. It's no wonder then that Satan made certain that the Pharisees, uh, after the um, fall of the temple in 70 and after the Bar Kokhba revolution in 120, when the Roman Empire was mad, going to kill them all, uh, the Pharisees were allowed to escape. Because Satan wanted to preserve that yes. bloodline, and the Sadducees were really Sadducee, right? <laughs> and, and wiped out. And not every every Pharisee. Uh, naturally is actually of that bloodline either that is mixed in. We know this because we had Nicodemus. We had Paul also who claimed to be a Pharisee. So if you look at Ezra, Ezra does say it was mainly the leaders of the uh, priest lines that were involved into this. So, and of course, as I said, though, we know that Yeshua identified who they were. That's where I believe the deadly wound came to the serpent because he got exposed what he did. Then this is what I'm going to be speaking about in Pennsylvania, Bonnie. I'm I am going through that entire trail of the Nephilim bloodline uh, and how it came down through the Scripture and how it's coming back today, because I think that is the 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 wound being healed. In fact, even when John, you know, when John he he wondered with great admiration about this woman, you know. Yeah. Again, it's a conjecture, but I think the reason why he was marveling over her is because he recognized who she was. Mm. You know? And because even the angel has to kind of get on to him a little bit. Why are you marveling over her? I'll show you who she really is. Yeah. Right. You know, John was seeing her restored. Uh, but, and then of course, now I used to always apply this. I thought it was the Vatican. But what really caused me to see this too, Bonnie, is when I saw the Vatican, when the Pope Francis brought the Vatican underneath the authority of the Orthodox rabbis in Israel and conceded to their demands, then I realized the harlots, Vatican is just one of the harlots, one of the daughters. And of course, we can, Yana goes into an incredible work in exposing how that the Vatican had so many crypto Jews infiltrated, did the damage, and then they would leave. Doesn't mean Vatican's done a lot of evil themselves, but a lot. In fact, even the Spanish Inquisition was ran by a Jewish um, convert. I think they call them uh, Moranos, you know, uh, which I don't think he was a forced convert. I think he was a willing convert. 
and then brought about all the evil on the Jewish people. Same thing that happened in Russia. You know, all the Christians that were killed. Who were they killed by? They were killed by crypto Jews that had got into power, Lenin and Stalin, both. We're, we're, and under the Vatican is all the Christian churches because now uh, yes. all, all the major uh, supposed evangelical leaders are making um, su submissions and uh, uh, acknowledging the authority of the Catholic Church. That's been a big move for probably 10 years. So under the Vatican is all the Christian religions and under the orthodox rabbis is the vatican plus all her children so all the families of man-made religions are coming together bonnie one thing i got to share with you real quick yeah because i don't know how much time we have time. i'll say share real quick when we talks about mystery babylon was written on her forehead right mother of harlots etc yeah. if you go to jeremiah chapter 3 It'll make more sense. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, saying, If a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, uh, may he return unto her again. Will not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Would it, wouldest thou yet return to me, saith the Lord? Lift up thine eyes into the high hills, and see where hast thou not been lain by the ways I have set for them, by the Arabian and the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy harlotries. Okay, again, whoredoms. Right? Yeah. And with thy wickedness, therefore the showers have been withheld, there hath been no latter rain, yet thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Wow. Again, there it's it written on her forehead right there in yeah. Jeremiah. Yeah. Do you think, uh, even though some of the uh, you know, non serpent Pharisees did exist, yes. That that they would sift those out when it comes to establishing the present priesthood because if they're going to line up people by the millions to be headed for violation of the Noahide laws that really takes a serpent's heart to do that yes it does Bonnie and I do believe that and my hope and desire is that those that are not part of that Satan's lineage are going to be the ones that the scripture says in Revelation 18.4 they're going to come out of her my people because he yeah. wants his people out uh, and the thing is same thing with the Christian uh, people uh, or believers of Yeshua whichever side they might be on we want them to come out because right now this is what's giving them all this power in, in fact, yes. in one work I was reading, it's not it's not a canonical work, guys. There's argument amongst church fathers whether or not it should be or should not be. But he clearly says in there that uh, that the, that the believers in the last day are going to fall for this antichrist because he does great. He'll do all the miracles, in fact, oh, except yes. the raising of the dead. He can't raise the dead. Yeah, right. Going to call down fire from heaven. Yeah, Allah uh, Elijah. Yeah, uh, it, it's going to be a phenomenal scene, and Signs of Wonders is kryptonite for humans. They are powerless. They just go gaga, and their brain turns off. Yep. Uh, with that, we have to close. We're way over. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Next week, Stephen is at a conference, uh, so uh, I'm going to have Jaco Prinsloo. I'm going to see if I can get him for next week. Uh, uh, he has an addendum for the message he gave a couple of weeks ago, so uh, very, very important, involving the next, uh, my soul, it's less than eight weeks away by now, but a warning for Halloween, November 1, November 2. So, uh, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank, thank you, you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we shall see you next week. Blessings in the next conference, Stephen. Thank you, thank you.